So I'm Nayaka. I live and work here at Darnakosha, where I am this morning. And I'm walking up the backfield on a fantastic April morning, actually. It's the 11th of April and it snowed last night. Gentle snow. And we've woken up to a clear blue sky and just a dusting of snow everywhere. So there's bright morning sunshine. That's absolutely spectacular. Stunning. I'm walking up the backfield this morning and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go for a walk. And while I'm out walking, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, well, being a Buddhist practitioner and spending time outdoors. I came to live here at Darnakosha about 25 years ago now. Definitely significantly influenced by the fact that it's a beautiful place and it meant that my work, the sort of activities of my life, if you like, could be sort of integrated with that sense of a connection with the outdoors and with nature and, and with the mountains. Very much Scotland. I was very taken with Scotland, that uh, sense of spaciousness. And it's not really wilderness, but it's a lot more wild than your average urban environment. Let's put it that way. And as a Buddhist, as a, a young new Buddhist, I was looking for a way of connecting my love of nature, my love of the outdoors with my Dharma practice and integrating that with work, with activity. In many ways, the connection with nature came first. In fact, you could say it's probably the connection with nature that got me interested in Buddhism in the first place. When I was out in my earlier days, in my teenage days, particularly I lived in Staffordshire, and I would go out into the woods and the lanes of Staffordshire. We would go out and look at birds and foxes and just generally spend time outdoors. And I realised that there was a sense of freedom, a freedom of mind, a sort of freedom of heart. I didn't really kind of recognise what it was very clearly in those days, just that I felt more alive and more free and more at ease than I did, say, in the family world or in school. Not that there was anything particularly wrong with those places. I just sort of connected with a, a sense of freedom. And I went later on at university and I went into science research work for a while after that. It would be the time spent outdoors, the time spent in nature, where I would feel at my most alive. And it was that sense of aliveness, that sense that there was something more to life, something sort of under the surface or just slightly out of reach that drove my early investigations into Buddhism and alternative ways of living and thinking about the world. So here I am, all those years later, still doing it. Just as I walk up the field here, there's a roe deer just run across in front of me. Um, the beautiful deer is the roe deer. We've got two species we see quite a lot here, the red deer and the roe deer. The roe deer are the smaller of the two. They tend to be slightly shyer, but yeah, they're lovely deer. So I'm a bit further up now and you can probably hear the sound of the water, the burn that runs along the side of Darnakosha tumbles through a gorge, which is a rather spectacular place. The uh, west of Scotland, of course, is famous for these tremendous gorges. The temperate rainforest, they sometimes talk about this sort of area as. And it does rain quite a lot, it's certainly true. So as I'm walking up through the woods here, what we have here is uh, ancient Scots pine trees. They are all of the same age, which suggests that they were at one time planted, rather than being a completely natural Scots pine woodland. Some of you will know this area. It's uh, above the top of the field. Very beautiful. And I say, even though it's almost certainly a planted environment, it feels so timeless. These tall trees, a little bit battered with age, and a rich carpet of moss. All this rain I was just talking about I means the bryophytes, the mosses and the ferns and the lichens and the liverworts all thrive in this wet environment. So we've got a carpet of moss and these ancient Scots pine trees. And I say, even though I suspect looking at the trees, they were planted because they are all of a similar age, still it feels timeless. It feels like the hand of man is just a little bit more distant than it normally is in a commercial forest. Sorry, I'm having to scramble through some wood here. That kind of timelessness is one of the things that when we're outdoors you can sort of plug into isn't it i'm walking along the side of a of a burn here watercourse that's been flowing 
well, for thousands of years, water's tumbled down these steep rocks, wearing away. Probably at the end of the last glaciation, most of this watercourse was cut, probably on a, down a channel that was already there from previous events. As the ice melted, scoured the rocks. And then these trees, even though these trees, as I say, are forestry, they feel timeless. It's like your own being starts to take its place in the world. That's one thing that struck me quite strongly sometimes being outdoors, particularly if you spend a number of days outdoors. You start to somehow feel like you're taking your place in the world. No longer trying to control the world so much, no longer trying to find my place in it. But my place in it is more naturally arising. It sounds slightly odd, but I'm feeling good through a lack of self-importance. <laughs> that sort of makes sense. The sort of a feeling of well-being through not being the centre of things. Yeah, not being the centre of things. It's still quite cold here this morning, so there's quite a lot of snow on the ground and the cold air in the burn, in the gorge, I can feel in the sun. Although the sun's up, we're not getting more than the odd shaft of sunlight through the dense canopy in the trees here. So it's quite frosty and I'm climbing quite steeply too. So yeah, that strange sense of well-being that arises from letting go of a sense of self-importance. I talked about being sort of sensually, if you like, surrounded by the man-made environment and how it feels different when you place yourself in a natural environment. Also, I live with my family. I work as the centre director at Darnacosha. So much of my time is spent in relationship with people where there's some kind of responsibility, some kind of duty. And, you know, this is a, generally a good thing, but I think it's helpful for the heart, helpful for the soul, so to speak, to have unconstrained time, unconstrained time. So there's been a real story in my life, a real journey of trying to develop a relationship between the uncontained, uncontrolled, open time where my heart and mind can expand into this, into the natural world and I can sort of let go of a degree of self-preoccupation. And then what you might call healthy responsibility, a healthy opportunity, you know, to give, and not to give service, but of all, all manner of ways, both to individuals and to the Dharma. So somewhere within those two paradigms of service and freedom, there's an opportunity for something greater to evolve. This bit's quite steep, so I'm gonna to have to turn off voice recording. Otherwise, all you'll hear is me scrambling around out of breath. So, quite a bit further up the forest track now. Nice to have the sun back. It's warming rays. Here to my left, I've got the hill of Stobkol, dusted in snow. Not a lot of snow, just, uh, just as I say, dusting and rocky, craggy environment. Lovely hills. The nice thing about the smaller hills in Scotland is they can be very, very quiet. So it's quite rare to see anybody on these hillsides who's not shepherds. And then looking to the south, you've got slightly higher hills, again with a bit more snow. Craig Moor, the big hill to the south of Donnacosha and Ben Stakath. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful April morning. So by spending time in a more gentle way outside, I think one of the great advantages that I felt of being able to live and work more closely with this environment is the ability to stop looking for something. The natural world is very abundant, it's a very rich environment. There's an awful lot going on. It's funny, isn't it? A lot of the time when we meditate, we deliberately simplify our environment. We go into a quiet space and we try to reduce the extraneous, distracting features of the world. Actually, when you spend time in nature, it's absolutely full. I mean, experience is always full, obviously. It's a slightly silly thing to say, isn't it? But when you sort of open your senses to the natural world in this way, the song, the birds out here, the feeling of the wind, the air, cold on my fingers. It's just a very full, a very rich 
sensual experience. And what I think I've found over the years is by having the time to simply inhabit that rich sensual experience, it's almost like I'm being invited into an ever deeper connection with it by stopping the looking, by stopping the trying to find something in it. It's as if the world around me invites me into a relationship with it. So the embodied experience of my own being can start to resonate with the world around me. It's as if I'm invited into it, as if something is calling my sense of self, my sense of my own being into relationship. That becomes what you might call a reciprocated relationship, where on the one hand I'm opening up to something, on the other hand it's calling me into relationship with it. It's a very gentle, it's a very gentle sort of way of being. I think I sort of first discovered this type of way of being probably most strongly in my 20s going camping. So I'd go off and camp in the hills, some of my little mountain tents, I'd be camping alone out in the mountain tops. And there's always a part of me wanted the best weather, I wanted the perfect view, the best sunrise, the best camp spot, always looking to optimise the experience. I think this is very human. We always look to optimise our experience. We always want a little bit more. And of course, sometimes you go out. There was the time that you booked in the off work, as it were, and you go out and you set your tent up and it just rains. And it's wet and it's cold. And part of you is thinking, why am I here? It's wet, it's cold, it's miserable. But you are, and you're going to be there for a number of days. And at some point, that wanting part of the mind starts to ease, it starts to let go. That's certainly how I found it, that wanting part of the mind starts to soften. And then the next wave of weather becomes something to be receptive to. Suddenly this basic relationship with nature starts to change and I'm no longer someone looking for something and start to become somebody who's part of that world who's immersed in it. So I start to feel much more deeply connected. Now the other thing that happens of course in those kind of conditions is there's very few people there. So that part of me that's uh, relating to humans gets to sort of be dropped as well. So my own mind, my own being, my own heart mind, able to move more freely, if you like, able to move more freely in a world that is no longer about me seeking a particular experience. So the invitation, the world starts to invite connection, invite relationship. It's no longer based on what I want from it, quite so strongly. Having said that, it's awfully pleasurable when uh, you do come out and it's a day like today. And it's just stunning. So when you start to accept the invitation of the land, feel its felt presence, start to sort of understand why so many cultures are animistic. As I think I said earlier on, I'm originally trained as a scientist. I'm definitely steeped in a more rationalistic Western culture. But that reciprocated aliveness, my aliveness and the aliveness of the world around me and the not separateness of those two things, as if from within and as if from out there, I think are quite natural, quite, yes, it's a very natural way of experiencing yourself in the world when we start to let go of our own self-preoccupation a little bit. Of course, the whole idea of separation between us and our senses, our sense experience and therefore the objects of the world that do surround us. Well, it's a bit difficult to really follow through, isn't it? I mean, on the one hand, it's a common sense that there are objects of the world, that such things exist out there and I exist here. There's a sort of common senseness to that. On the other hand, how could I experience any of this without both it being there and me being here? There's a reciprocal there's a reciprocal arrangement which is utterly inescapable. So perhaps it's not surprising that as I open my senses, as I relax my sense of separateness, that the aliveness that I feel as part of me 
should also be felt as part of the world around me. I don't know if you can hear, there's a waterfall just below me now. There's actually quite a lot of ice on it, so it's clearly been cold last night. And you get ice, minus six, you start to get a bit of ice on the water. I doubt it's been that cold, but anyway. Further up, nestling in the edge of the hills, is where the Bothy is. Darling Coach is you know, what we call the Bothy, the top solitary retreat hut. So if you have three weeks or more spare, and fancy a long solitary, that's a fantastic place. Nestles up in the hills there. I was last there in January. I did a short retreat in January, a perk of living here. It was minus 10 at night, deep, crisp snow. I'd sit on the veranda and listening to the owls and the foxes, the vixens yelp at that time of year. Actually, last January it snowed a lot. Me and Rosie, my daughter, came over these hills in snowshoes one day in January. It was just stunning. Lovely thing to do. The nature of our sense experience actually is connection. It's almost like it's the way we try to control that experience that causes the problem. When we allow our senses to be open and the world to move through them freely, which of course is, I find anyway, I find much easier when I'm out in a place like this. I can enjoy and appreciate without so much hanging on, without so much desiring to sort of control of my experience. And things of beauty just sort of pop out. You don't need to look for them. There's a little stream here, which I must have walked past hundreds of times over the years. But there's just a, a little delicacies, the water. Gently pours over the rocks and little ice forms and bits of snow. There's a magic to it. There's a magic to it. And as I say, that sense of as if alive, as if things were imbued with life. My aliveness and the aliveness of the world somehow coming together. So I've come up to the flank of Craig Rach, which is the hill to the northeast of Darnakosha. I've got the sun behind me and the expanse of the glen opening out in front of me. The still waters of Loch Voyle and the snow-dusted hills. And a completely blue sky. Just a gentle breeze up here, so I hope we don't get too much wind interference on my pickup. I tried doing one of these recordings about a week ago, but the whole thing got destroyed by wind interference, which is why I'm out this morning, actually, because it's almost windless just picking up a bit of a breeze here. Yes, I've been talking about the sort of lifeful, sensual abundance. I find it easier to experience when out in nature, when surrounded by the natural world, when what's being reflected back to me is the natural unfoldment of things. And my own aliveness, my own sense of myself, often feels like it can unfold more naturally in a more easeful way even though spending time outdoors isn't always entirely comfortable. In fact, almost invariably it's not. But somehow it doesn't matter quite so much. It's like things are stripped down a bit, aren't they? They're stripped back to, well, actually, is this feeling cold actually a threat to me? Is this feeling hungry really a problem? Usually, certainly in the modern West, usually the answer to those things actually is no. Obviously in the mountains you need to take sensible precautions, but even then with management of risk, the fact of discomfort is no longer such a big deal. Having said that, I think Mokshadi is camping on one of the hilltops somewhere hereabouts, so she probably had minus five or minus six in her tent this morning if she camped at height. That is getting slightly chilly. Hopefully she's got a warm jacket. So anyway, this, uh, this sensual abundance, this lifefulness. I mean, in Buddhism, we talk a lot about impermanence, don't we? And I think one of the things I've started to find very, very enriching is that letting go into the unfoldment of sense experience is in itself a contemplation of impermanence. The world is constantly changing, experience is constantly moving, constantly alive. So that very lifefulness, that very sensual reciprocity that I was sort of talking about is where impermanence is to be found. It's to be found in the emergence of the new as much as in the letting go of the old. In fact, it's in the letting go 
in, it's in the letting go that, that emergence happens. I remember a few years ago doing a solitary retreat. I'd gone to camp on the Cairngorm Plateau thinking that would be exciting and it'd be a great place to spend some time. And it rained a lot. But as I left the mountains, having spent a week listening to the rain and contemplating or listening to the rushing of water, and I even spent a time contemplating how the rain was gradually eroding the mountains and really started to immerse myself in impermanence, in impermanence at a very sensual level. And, ah, oh, man, the love, the sense of joy and delight that arises in that is quite extraordinary. I still find that there's something I can plug into in impermanence as an emergent state when I allow my sense experience to unfold more naturally. So I hope you've enjoyed your morning walk. Thanks for listening. And I've tried to share a little bit of my own connection with the natural world. And yeah, get out and enjoy yours. Take time to listen, to breathe, to feel the invitation. Feel the invitation of the land into relationship. <laughs>